koalas are amazing creatures. If you can get an animal to trust you and want to be with you, that's one of the most precious things you can have in life. The koala, Australia's national heartthrob. Cute and cuddly, they are irresistibly adorable. When European settlers first came to Australia's shores, they thought koalas were monkeys, sloths, or even bears. They are still called koala bears even today, but koalas are not bears. They are marsupials, just like kangaroos. Marsupials give birth to immature young that develop in a pouch on the mother's abdomen. Found only in Australia, koalas are elusive creatures, living mostly solitary lives in the highest reaches of eucalyptus trees. It takes a keen eye to spot koalas in the treetops. Usually, you see them wedged between branches. Chances are, the koala will be sound asleep. A koala will sleep anywhere from 16 to 20 hours a day. Most of their energy gets spent eating and digesting the tough and fibrous eucalyptus leaves. These leaves make up nearly all of the koala's diet, even though they're about as nutritious as cardboard. The leaves also contain eucalyptus oils that are extremely poisonous to other animals, including people. Koalas can eat the leaves with no problem because special microorganisms in their digestive tract break down the potentially fatal toxins. No wonder koalas have the eucalypts largely to themselves. Eucalyptus trees provide everything the koalas need for survival, their food, shelter, and even water. Remarkably, eucalyptus leaves contain enough water that koalas rarely have to drink. Even the name koala has been interpreted to mean no drink in the Australian Aboriginal language. Koalas are so dependent on the eucalyptus that if the trees were removed, the koala would be considered homeless and their chances for survival would be grim. Since European settlers came to Australia in 1788, an estimated 80% or four-fifths of the trees have been destroyed. Of what remains, almost none is protected. As the number of trees diminishes, so do the koalas. Thousands die each year as development spreads. In metropolitan areas, koalas have all but disappeared. Estimates of wild koala populations run to between 40 and 80,000 animals left in the wild, which actually is not very many at all considering that there were probably in excess of 10 million before they were hunted for their furs in the 1920s and 1930s. Most Australians see their first koala not in the wild, but in zoos and sanctuaries. Captive koalas can be a challenge to care for because everything they depended on in the wild must be provided by the keepers, especially eucalyptus leaves. It's hard work for the keepers, but they are dedicated and passionate about their jobs, and they work with a purpose, helping to save these animals. Simon Burney came to Australia's Sunshine Coast in Queensland, hoping to find a job working with animals. All he had was a degree in chemical engineering and some labor skills, but no experience. Lots of gates. I was very much of the mind that I didn't have the qualifications. I didn't have the experience, would I really get a job? And then someone told me you'd never get a job on the Sunshine Coast working with animals. And that fired me up and I thought, well, I really want to do this. So I went out and I sold myself. I believed in myself that I could do it. And I went out with that attitude and I got the job and I can do it. Bernie is a keeper at the Forest Glen Sanctuary in Southeast Queensland. They weren't looking for anyone with wildlife qualifications because there's a lot of other jobs involved, like cleaning up after the animals. We drive a tractor around, we take tour groups through. So I was a truck driver for a short time and that came in useful when driving the tractor around the park. I've done some landscaping and labouring 
which they immediately jumped at because I'd be able to do a lot of park maintenance. You get very good at carrying a lot of things at once. I was a waiter for two years, so that experience came in invaluable in this job. The majority of my job is taking up with the koalas. I obviously have to look after them, clean their pens out. Would anyone like to hold a koala? And I use them quite often to do photos with people. Okay, ready? Nice smile. There are various other jobs around the park. We have kangaroos that I have to look after. And we have about 60 acres of park with deer. The deer generally look after themselves. As long as they're fed, they're very happy indeed. The koalas are the big job. Koalas are very fussy eaters and feeding them can be almost a full-time job in itself. It's similar to looking after kids quite often. In here, they're incapable of looking after themselves because they don't have access to their normal food trees as they would in the wild. So you have to make sure that they have their food every day. To extract enough energy from the leaves, each koala needs to eat about three pounds a day. And the leaves must always be fresh, which is why Bernie spends his morning gathering new leaves from the surrounding forest. He cuts only from branches close to the ground, so as not to deprive wild koalas living in the forest who prefer dining in the treetops. Koalas will occasionally supplement their diet with bark, gum nuts, and even soil. Bernie knows it's the eucalyptus leaves they prefer, and he knows how to find them. We've got a definite crinkle cut, like a crinkle cut chip along the side there. And eucalypts have a vein running right the way around the outside. Now these are very green on the top, but almost like a silvery matte finish on the bottom. But the foolproof test, which is what the koalas use, they'll pull over a branch and they'll smell the leaf. And that's how we pick their leaves as well. We'll pick a leaf, we'll crunch it up, and if it smells good, if it smells like eucalyptus or Vicks Vapor Rub, then these guys are probably going to eat it. It's important for us not only to give the koalas good leaves, but also to give them a good variety. They're similar to us in that if you have the same thing too often, you don't want it anymore, no matter how much you like it. There are about 600 types of eucalypt growing in Australia. Koalas will only eat eucalyptus. And as far as we know, koalas around Australia eat about 100 different types. We've only got 17 types growing here and these koalas eat about 8 or 10 of them. So we've only got about 8 or 10 types of tree we can cut for starters. Well every day we put the leaves in we have to fill up their water pots. It's important for them to get the water out of the leaves. And if the leaves can't get any more water into them they're going to dry out very quickly. The koalas don't drink water. So they're very dependent on the water in the new leaves that they're going to eat. And unless we fill these tubs up with water, then the leaves aren't going to be able to replace the water during the day and they're going to dry out very quickly. As you might well imagine, there's not much energy in leaves, similar to us eating lettuce leaves. We'd be pretty tired and that's the reason for them sleeping for 16 to 20 hours every day. A lot of people are under the misunderstanding that koalas get drunk or intoxicated on the leaves. It's purely low energy diet. All they eat is eucalyptus leaves. And if you can imagine living on a diet purely of lettuce, I think you'd probably be in a bit of a trance too. As they do sleep for so long, they don't really have to occupy themselves with much because they're not awake for long. Most of the time they're awake, you'll see them eating. If they're not eating and they are awake, they'll probably be scratching. Koalas are very clean animals. They don't suffer from fleas and lice because they're full of eucalyptus oil. They have a grooming tool on their back feet, but we have a double claw there, and they use that the same way as we use a comb or a hairbrush. And it just traps any dead hair in their coat and keeps them groomed. 
that helps them to stay completely waterproof and then enables them to breathe easily through their skin so they can regulate their temperature well. And on their front paws, you'll notice they've got two thumbs and three fingers. Makes a lot of sense for them. They've got a lot of strength in their forearms. They do a lot of climbing. So it means they have equal strength on both sides of their hand rather than having a weak side. This is Digi, he's our biggest male. Hey Dig, having a good sniff of my shoe. And this is Harvey, what are you up to Harv? As you can see they hate being cuddled. Hey boy. It's not good to have favourites I suppose, but if I do have a favourite it would be Monty. He's almost two years old, he's a young male. And I'm not sure, I'd like to think that they like being with us. It certainly makes you feel very special. You come in? None of the rest of it really matters when they do something like this. But it could simply be that we're more comfortable than a tree and a little bit warmer. People come from all over the world to see koalas. Their first stop is a koala show, where Bernie gets to teach visitors everything they've always wanted to know about koalas and more. Well, good morning, everyone. Welcome to Forest Glen. We'll introduce you to our koalas. We have Pixie just up in this tree here. She's the oldest of our babies. She's about 11 months old. And here's Millie. She falls in the middle at about 10 and a half months. And right down the bottom here, you can just about see Acacia, our youngest. She's about 10 months old. Their closest relative is the wombat, and wombats mate for life. The koalas only mate for two minutes, it's all over then. And the male takes off, he doesn't want to see the mother or the baby again. The males also get a little bit smelly. That's because they have a scent gland right in the middle of their chest, and they use that to mark out their territory in the wild. They rub their smell on all of their trees. That tells other males to stay away, and it tells other females that there's a male koala around, so hang around if you're interested. It's important for them to protect their trees because they will claim a territory of trees for their entire life if they can. And in an area such as this, depending on the quality of the trees, a dominant male can claim up to 60 acres as a territory. So they do claim a large area. They are very misunderstood. A lot of people seem to think that if you provide a small corridor of trees, you can get a whole colony of koalas living there. Now sure, if the trees are good enough quality and there's enough of them, that might be possible. But in a natural situation, there's no way that's going to happen. At present, there's estimated to be between 40 and 80,000 koalas left in the world, and half of them live in southeast Queensland, where we are now. There's a lot of eucalypt here, and it's a good climate for them. It's also a good climate for people, and this area is probably developing faster than anywhere else in Australia. And that's putting these guys at risk. There's a lot of development going on. The land prices are going through the roof. So their trees are being cut down. Although the koalas have been protected since the fur trade in the 1930s, their trees aren't. And if we cut down their trees, as they have such a specialised diet, they suffer greatly. It also removes their homes. They have nowhere to live. So with all the property development going on, their trees are fast disappearing. Any koalas that aren't killed directly by that have to come down to the ground and find new territories because they've lost trees. And generally they're either run over or they're attacked by our dogs. As a result of all those factors, we're killing about 4,000 koalas every year. And on the present estimate, that could be as much as 10% of the world population. So we are having a pretty devastating effect on these guys. And since they're so hard to see in the wild, a lot of people don't appreciate that they're disappearing because they don't see them anyway. There is only one agency that's really pushing to save the koalas, and that's the Australian Koala Foundation. And their main move at the moment is to save their habitat. Because as long as their trees are being cut down, we're going to lose them. Once their food's gone, the koalas can't survive. Deborah Tabart is executive director of the Australian Koala Foundation. For many years, she's visited the bush of Redland Bay in southeast Queensland, where koalas once thrived. 
Fires recently swept through here, and Tabard is curious to know how the koalas are coping, if she can find them. You know, when I first came here 10 years ago, you could just walk in here and find 30 or 40 koalas. And, and look how hard it is for us today. We may only see three or four or five koalas here today, and I think that's telling us something. I think that it's saying the population is going down, and I can't tell you how sad it makes me feel that one day I'll come in here and not see one. The joy of sort of wandering through here and then all of a sudden finding one, it's like finding gold, I think. So I spend my life with my head up in the air. Uh -huh. We're seeing um, a young female. She looks in pretty good condition given that there was a fire here recently. A second koala is found, but Tabart recognizes that this one is not in good shape. You know, he doesn't look plump, and, and that just the color of his fur just makes you think that he's not quite as healthy, he's not quite as gray, and not quite as well. Tabart spots a third koala, barely visible in the treetops. They are so cryptic and they're so hard to see and that it takes you such a long time to learn, like I do now, how hard they are to see. Largely as a result of the Australian Koala Foundation's work, the koala in southeast Queensland has been listed as a vulnerable species, giving them more protection. However, with continuing habitat loss, koalas as a species face becoming endangered. This is what my job's about. We've just been in the most beautiful bush. We've seen three koalas living happily here. And as we walk out this road, then we have come across uh, <laughs> what the koalas would call absolute devastation. There's not one tree here. We need to be more harmonious. We're just too intent on destroying everything modifying everything, and we don't need to. Adele Casson is a resident of Koala Beach, Australia's first environmentally planned subdivision, south of the Queensland border in New South Wales. Environmental planning went into saving local koalas by protecting their trees. They had to move the road, they had to realign the road in a couple of blocks because a koala uses this tree in the middle of the road and they weren't allowed to cut it down. All of the bushland up here is all protected. 270 hectares of land has been handed over to 36 koalas. On this day, the koalas are scarce, but evidence of their presence shows up in the trees. They come up the tree, they just grip on with their big claws, and up they go. The residents of Koala Beach live according to a few simple rules. We have to have fences at least eight inches off the ground so that wildlife can roam freely. We're encouraged to drive slower in here. People are encouraged to plant food trees. The most important part is we have no cats and dogs because they compete with the native animals. There are other places now that are coming along after us that are trying to incorporate koala-friendly guidelines into their place and they look to us as the leader, the first, to see how we're coping. Koala Beach demonstrates that environmentally planned communities go a long way in helping save koalas and other indigenous species. Pictures on walls don't replace looking at the real thing. Conserve what you've got now and you can show your children what you loved when you were little. There is still difficulty finding common ground between developers and conservationists. As more land gets developed, the need for conservation grows. Like ambassadors, koalas in zoos and sanctuaries are helping to raise awareness of the problems that are causing trouble for their wild cousins. However, zoos are no substitute for the wild. I'm not a big fan of keeping animals in cages at all. And I was a little wary of how I'd deal with this job. 
but having got to know the koala's situation and their plight in the wild, at face value they're instantly better off being in here than they are in the wild because they face it up to a 20 year life expectancy in here compared to six years in the wild. I consider I've got an important job to do in educating people about how the koalas are in the world and the plight that they face. And if I can get other people to experience the same passion and feelings that I do, then I'm doing my bit and maybe you never know who you're going to be talking to. Maybe someone will be able to change something out there. But even tipping away at individual people, it all helps and every bit of money, every bit of effort is going to help these koalas. Okay, well Working with animals and children isn't everybody's thing. I think for a lot of people it would really suit them and obviously it suits me. I believe I've found what I'm supposed to be doing. Every day is a joy and you just get to really appreciate life.